Hello, distinguished guests. This week on the Nesson Soccer Show, Marcus and I discuss Antonio Conte's situation with Chelsea as they're set to face West Brom this weekend. Plus, we hit some Christian Pulisic transfer rumors, break down Juventus versus Tottenham and Real Madrid versus PSG in their Champions League round of 16 matches. Also a quick hit on Riyad Mahrez's situation with Leicester and a sum up of what we expect from the U.S. soccer presidential election this weekend. Hello and welcome to the Nesson Soccer Show. I'm Mark, sitting across from Marcus in our new digs, the dark and compact room. Uh, kind of a little bit of a closet feel. Marcus, what do you think? Uh, I think it's like a recording studio. Yeah, um, technical. It's technically a recording studio. Yeah, next week I'll bring some, I'll bring some bars, some heat. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, so we're strictly a audio podcast now, no longer video. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a little more comfortable. I'm always uh, self-conscious about my figure and um, I'm, I'm excited to be off camera. I am personally devastated by not <laughs> being on camera. <laughs> Um, and that's all I'm going to say about it all right. right now. Well, there's a lot going on in the world of soccer, and we, we do like to talk about soccer. First and foremost is what's going on with Chelsea in the Premier League, and specifically Antonio Conte, their head coach. They're still in the top four, still in Champions League, still in the FA Cup, but they lost 4-1 to to Watford after going down to 10 men 30 minutes into their match. It's kind of been a downward spin, not exactly making great strides in the January transfer window. But did they do anything? Is, I don't think they did anything in January. Yeah, I don't think uh, exactly. Oh, that's not true. No, Small maybe. strides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is a team that won the Premier League last year. Right. And now, of course, Man City is running away from the field. And while it may not be so surprising to see some of the teams that far behind Man City, I think most people are surprised, you know, going into the season that it has become... that. Chelsea hasn't been able to keep pace at all. Yeah. So we kind of went through and like tried to dissect what has gone wrong, and you came up with some good things. I think the most obvious one is Man City got really good, and there's not really any secret to that. Right. Another thing which we left off is defending the Premier League title is one of the hardest things to do, and yeah. uh, I don't think anybody's been able to do it since maybe 2006, 2007. Uh, it seems to be getting harder and harder every year, and you can almost expect, like, look at Leicester City. You know, yeah. They won it two years ago, and then, boy, they fell off. Uh, you know, they fired Claudio Ranieri just to, just to save themselves from relegation. Take yeah. Who won it last year? Chelsea. Chelsea, Chelsea yeah. won it last year. They're nowhere close this year. So, yeah, it's uh, it's just one of those things that... We're now past the 10-year mark before or since a team's been able to uh, defend their title. And Chelsea's just the latest victim. And you know what Chelsea does when things go bad. Well, we'll get into that and get into why their West Brom match this weekend could be all doom and gloom. But specifically with Conte, he didn't really get the players he wanted over the summer going into the year. And none of the transfers that they did make really have been, have worked out that much. No. They're, um, um, I mean, they've had, some of them have had good moments, but, you know, if we're expecting these transfers and we're really talking about uh, four big ones, Alvaro Morata, Tiemu Bakayoko. There you go. Danny Drinkwater and Antonio Rudiger. Yeah. Four signings that, well, when they came, people thought maybe they would be you know, they would strengthen the team, but yeah, uh, n neither, none of these four have been consistent. None of them have been, have hit the heights that have been expected, um, right. including Bakayoko, who's just been atrocious. And I believe there were nine new sightings in all. Yes, yeah. And I guess when there's that much turnover, it's almost, well, in hindsight's twenty twenty, but that's a lot of changes to make from a team that won the league. It is, yeah. But the team has gotten worse. It's not even that maybe they stayed at the same level and then Man City leapfrogs them. Mm -hmm. It's they, They're not as good as they were last year. This Chelsea club participating in last year's Champions League would probably be in a similar fighting for the top four position. 
Yeah, that was uh, that's part of it that I actually forgot about is that the demands of the added demands of the Champions League yeah. um, is you know it's taking its toll on Chelsea. Look at a guy like N'Golo Conte who was their uh, midfield linchpin. He can't play every game right. in England and in Europe. No. So yeah, they had a they they had almost a free run at it last year, where they weren't in the Champions League, weren't in the Europa League, and made the most of it. But this year, yeah, they're they're dealing with what big clubs go through. Um, and so I guess that's where it comes in when you bring in all these new players. You're kind of looking to add depth. But why didn't Antonio Conte necessarily want these players? And why has there sort of been a power struggle developing within the club between the manager and the you know owners? Well, this isn't the thing about Chelsea is that they are Chelsea has a structure that is put in place where the manager is just the manager. He's there to coach the team, but he's not there buying and selling the proverbial groceries. And this has been highly successful since the owner, Roman Abramovich, came to the club in 2003, I think it was, right? uh, maybe 2002. Um, You know, Chelsea's arguably the winningest club in England since then. I'm I'm looking, they've won five titles since then. you know, since early 2000s. Yeah, yeah, and some FA Cups and yeah. one Champions League that was a bit of a fluke. Europa League, League Cups, Chelsea's... They, Don't they, diminish they, winning they, the they, Champions League for Chelsea. It was a fluke. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll tackle that next week. <laughs> but, yeah, Chelsea's had... Uh, they, they've been wildly successful uh, under this structure, but, you know... Coaches have come and gone, and coaches have fought this particular power, and they always lose. Now, Antonio Conte is a specific kind of coach who is really demanding on his players and his directors above him, his his board. And, uh, you know, he went three years at Juventus, won three Serie A titles, and then fell out over, you guessed it, transfers. Right. So, you know, we kind of knew that he was going to be he would fall out eventually over transfers, especially right. because at Chelsea, Michael Eminalo, their old technical director, was the Boston one. Boston University uh, alum, by Did the way. Did he go to Boston yeah. University? Oh, wow. All yeah. right. I knew he had, uh, I remember he played in Major League Soccer, but I didn't know he went to BU. Right. Yeah, wow. but so you're saying technical director for a long time at Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, he was the technical director from 2011. Uh, he's, he was one of Roman Abramovich's right-hand men. And Abramovich is, you know, he doesn't speak in the media. He doesn't, he's not one of those activist owners. He puts right. his people in place and let them run the show. Uh, the other one being Mariana Gronoskaya, uh, <laughs> if I, I might have butchered her name and I'm sorry, but she is probably the top power broker left at Chelsea. And yeah, she's. You know. Well, do we think Emanalo was maybe a middleman between Conte and the ownership group? Oh, he was, yeah. yeah. He was the uh, he was probably Conte's biggest supporter and mm-hmm. a bit of the heat shield to and keep him from his going. Voice in those meetings that maybe Conte wasn't involved in yeah. as far as getting players. Right, right. Um, yeah, so it's been uh, it's been problematic and last off season we kinda knew something was up with Chelsea because Conte signed a new contract. That was for more money, but didn't add any years to it. So, yeah, this is, uh, it looked like it was short term at the beginning. So Antonio Conte signed a new contract, same amount of years, more money. Uh, We we knew something was going to happen at the end of this season. But this week, all the chatter has been Conte might go. Um, It was actually written where if they lost to Watford, Chelsea would fire him. I didn't necessarily believe it because Chelsea's yeah. still alive in the Champions League, still alive in the FA Cup, and still in fourth place, I believe. Yep, they're so, in fourth place. Yeah, they're not going to win the league, but they are on track for doing something positive, making something positive out of this season. Yeah. Well, Conte saving his job, I think, is just keeping Chelsea in those top four positions. Uh, you know, the club does its budgeting and its planning for being in the Champions League. So as long yeah. as it still looks like they're in the Champions League, uh, he should be safe through the end of the season, I think. Yeah. Well, assuming that the worst does happen and West Brom is able to maybe 
seal of victory versus Chelsea this weekend and send them into spiral and Conte is, is sacked right away, what do you think would happen next as far as managers that would be hired to replace him? I think they would go for a stopgap, somebody that would come in for two months, sorry, three months, maybe four. Yeah. Uh, most likely being Goose Hiddink, who took over after Jose Mourinho was fired. And then uh, Carlo Ancelotti, he's out of work, and I think he's in London right now. Uh, he's somebody who could come in and take over for a couple months, maybe right the ship. Uh, that seems to be what Chelsea has been, uh, what, what they've been doing. You know, Chelsea's been firing managers for a <laughs> decade now. Um, but what they always seem to do is bring somebody from either in-house or close by to just steady the ship for a couple months and then they get somebody right somebody that new to make the most sense. and then the cycle continues and that's if they if they fired Conte in the begin or before the end of the season right now after the season two names have come up from Spain Luis Enrique former Barcelona coach won a treble with them in 2014 and Diego Simeone who is uh, Atletico Madrid's coach Everybody in Europe has wanted him for the last few years, but he's so wedded and embedded to that club, they haven't been able to get him. You know, it's possible. Should he want a new challenge or want to, uh, you know, try his luck somewhere else? Yeah, Chelsea would be interested in him. All right. Well, good to know. And and what I was going to say is that West Brom has been... It seems that Chelsea will come up against West Brom at a hectic time in their season and lose and then sack their manager the next day or day of. Well, that's happened uh, three times before, I believe, uh, <laughs> or maybe twice before in recent years. So, yeah, they play Monday. Yeah, It's something course. to watch. Maybe Tuesday we'll uh, have some news on Conte. Keep your eye on that one. But there was a board meeting after the Watford game, and they decided to stick with him. So I don't think they would have another board meeting after the next game and then change their minds, but you never know. There's always a bit of chaos running around there. Rumors swirling, and more rumors swirling about Christian Pulisic and his possible transfer away from Borussia Dortmund. This has come up before, and I think it is, I don't think anybody will be surprised for him to eventually move away from Dortmund. No. But it seems like maybe it'll actually happen at this point. Uh, Manchester United and Bayern Munich are both reportedly in the mix to try and get him. What what are your biggest, like, what, what do you buy into most with uh, these latest rumors with Pulisic? Pulisic is probably Dortmund's biggest asset now that uh, Obama Yang is gone and uh, Usman Dembele was sold at the beginning of the season. So, yeah, he's become, uh, he went from a youth player with the club who they plucked out of Pennsylvania to, uh, yeah, probably their most valuable asset. I think he was, well, it was weird. I, you know, it was, a, it was in a uh, German newspaper, so we have to give it a little bit of credence. They said his value was at 45 million, which in today's market seems a little low for budding superstar, yeah. uh, especially given that Dembele went for about 120 a few months ago. But that's what they say. That's something, that's a figure that Man United could, you know, they could find in their in between the couch cushions. Bayern Munich could come up with that money. Uh, which one does he go to? I don't know. Um, I think Bayern Munich would probably be better for him because he is settled in the country. He's settled in the league. Yeah. Uh, he speaks the language. I'm not saying he doesn't speak English. Right. But, uh, <laughs> he, he's definitely settled in the German scene. And going to Bayern Munich, you know, that's a club that, that's where you really learn how to be a world-class player and what it takes and what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to really to play at that level. Um, yeah. And that's no disrespect to Dortmund. That's no disrespect to even Manchester United. But Bayern Munich is a club that is you know, competing for the Bundesliga and the UEFA Champions League every year. They are a super club. And if Pulisic is going to be a super player... He should go to a super club, especially at his age. He's only 19, you know, three years at Bayern, four years at Bayern. He could go and play wherever he wanted for the rest of, the li uh, the rest of his life, and he'd be fully prepared and have uh, the pedigree. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> convinced 
that Pulisic will even be moving this summer. Just not yet. I think he will move. I think basically he's there for an, he's at Dortmund for another year and a half before he's moved. Uh, uh, well, his contract is up in 2020. Yeah. So I don't think he's unhappy there. I don't think he thinks he's grown beyond the club or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I think he still believes he has a lot to learn and that he wants to continue f- to learn from the people that have taught him and, and helped him grow into the player that he's become. And once he feels that he is ready, he'll make the move. And I think it'll be a decision that really he has a big say in. And so I just don't think it's, I don't think it's happening yet. And so... You don't I, think it's happening this summer? No, I don't. And I don't think that these rumors necessarily are... I think it's maybe just, you know, writers kind of uh, boiling the pot a little bit and... Well, this stuff doesn't come from nowhere. Yeah. You know, it has to be... Well, sometimes writers will make up whatever the hell they want. Name one. Uh, I can't. <laughs> um. <laughs> As somebody who writes about sports for a living, <laughs> no, you... You know, you're, they're often accused of doing that, but you can't just make things up out of thin air. Pulisic has two years left on his contract. His club, Dortmund, might be they're either treading water or they're sliding backwards from certainly from the heights of recent seasons. And if they don't do something to really, you know, push themselves forward, I'm not saying they're going to catch Bayern Munich, but. Yeah. Uh, how long does Pulisic should stay there just to be there? Right. You know, they're not they're not really competing for anything anymore. I think maybe next summer might d- depending on their summer transfer plans and how what the club has going forward, you know, if Bayern Munich comes calling or Manchester United comes calling, you go. You know, he has a say in it, but yeah, these are these are places where you know, there's tens of thousands of professional players around the world and only about 40 of them 40 of them are getting games at either of these clubs so right let's move on to matches of the weekend and we're also going to sort of look ahead to next week's champion champions league matches but before we get to that Tottenham and Arsenal play on Saturday February 10th 7:30 a.m. at Wembley Stadium always a big match at least in London any thoughts on this one why do we want to talk about this one because uh, Arsenal is suddenly back in the in the news due to their January transfer spending, which we analyzed to death last week. It's the North London Derby. Yeah, always a big game in London. You know, for tot- for for Arsenal fans and Tottenham fans, this you know this game means the world. Yeah, it'll be it'll be early. It'll be at Wembley, and there'll be a big big crowd, a lot of fireworks. I'm kind of more interested in Tottenham's match after that. Versus Juventus, Champions League round of 16, back uh, underway at Champions League. This is going to be at Juventus Stadium. Tottenham, as we may have even forgotten, had an incredible Champions League group stage and kind of surprised a lot of people. They um, did. Did they win the group or was they it? They did. They uh, won the group of death, as we said, with Real Madrid and Dortmund. Juventus reached the final last year, maybe have taken the slightest of steps backward this year, but aside from Real Madrid and PSG, this is the most interesting round of 16 matchup I think we have in this year's Champions League. Yeah, that'll definitely be the game to watch on Tuesday. Although I think, you know, Tottenham fans are really geared up for this. They think they have a good shot at getting to the, uh, be the quarterfinals, but I get the feeling that Juventus will pick them apart uh, on the counterattack, Tottenham like they like to press high, play fast, take risks going forward. Juventus, what do we call them? The old lady of Italian yeah. football. You know, they're everybody always they're, forgets about Juventus. Yeah, yeah, they're. I mean, they've been in two Champions League finals in the last three or four years. So, yeah, um, the same group of players is, you know, these guys are seasoned and battle hardened, battle tested, right. and I have a feeling Tottenham will be a little too excited to uh, really keep their heads when. You know, when they go up against this savvy group of Juventus players. I think this first leg at Juventus Stadium will be probably like a one nothing victory for Juventus. Mm-hmm. They'll stand fast, stop Tottenham, get a counter-attacking goal of some kind. kind of almost not, I don't want to say cheap, but they'll hold their own against Tottenham. And then the really, the big wild card I think is back at Tottenham in the second leg. Kind of hard to 
feel out what's going to happen there. Right, right. Um, but uh, yeah, the, I would, yeah, I would, I would, I'd give Juventus a uh, narrow victory. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not saying they're gonna they're gonna blow anybody out, but yeah, they should be they should be really good. The biggest match, clearly, of the oh, round of sixteen. Yes. Real Madrid versus PSG. Cristiano Ronaldo, Neymar, a whole list of characters. This one will be first leg is at Real Madrid. PSG has been on fire, but now it's time for them. Like this is what they got Neymar for. Yeah. And this is why they've built their roster the way they have is so that they can beat Real Madrid in the knockout rounds of Champions League. Maybe they didn't want to get this draw this early on, but you had to beat them at some point. You're yeah, have to it's beat funny. Nobody, like you know, nobody wanted PSG in the quarterfinal or in the round of sixteen. Nobody wanted Real Madrid in the round of sixteen. <laughs> they get each other. So they got each other. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a Valentine's Day match made in uh, UEFA. A love letter to the soccer world from UEFA. <laughs> Real Madrid, PSG. Uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to this one for. I don't know, two, like and a, two and a half months yeah. uh, just waiting for it. And the day is almost here. And by almost, I mean seven days from now. <laughs> yeah, any, what do you look for in this match? I mean, Real Madrid hasn't had the kind of season or campaign that they were hoping for. Yeah, they've been but pretty. But here they are. Yeah, blood and thunder mostly. Yeah, I have a feeling, I mean, if Real Madrid goes out in the round of 16, this could be the end of for Zinedine, Zinedine yeah, Zidane, I was say. who is, uh, you know, the two-time defending Champions League winning coach. It would be shocking, but I guess I wouldn't be too shocked if that's the result. You know, things Real, happen fast, right? Yeah, yeah. Real Madrid's targets are usually the Champions League semifinal or final. So, right. But yeah, they they haven't been at their level this season, and actually, Bayern Munich's coach. I saw him uh, uh, some quotes from him yesterday. And he was saying that Real Madrid let important players go, important veterans in the offseason, uh, James Rodriguez, Pepe, and somebody else who I can't remember, and thought that they would fill those gaps with young players uh, in an effort to save on salary and, you know, kind of evolve the team to the next, next level. Well, those that were supposed to replace James and supposed to replace Pepe just haven't been... Uh, up to the standard, and then you got a guy like Cristiano Ronaldo who hasn't been playing as well, certainly domestically. Is so. he getting old? No, well, he's thirty-three. So, do you think he's done being Cristiano Ronaldo? Besides, say from some flashes, I mean, he, is he done being that guy for an entire season? No, no, uh, no. He's He's got a problem with his with his team and his employer, and it's affecting his performances, I believe. Uh huh. Well, we'll see how that one goes. 2.45 p.m. In, in Madrid on Wednesday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. You did you, said did you just, <laughs> just, did that just, just occur to you? Yes. Um, <laughs> all, all my metaphors and puns and, jeez, we got to get out of this closet here. <laughs> We gotta turn the light on next time. Yeah, maybe that's. Have a coffee right, right as we start. Maybe that's what it is. Well, you, you got a final word? Nope. No? <laughs> well, I got a final word. Actually, I wanted to talk real quick about Riyad Mahrez. Oh, I guess has been. Okay. He's been holding out of practice? This is yeah, last Riyad, Riyad Mahrez has been on strike for the last week. Right, so he's not. Lester has played and he, was, he didn't play. Yeah. And they I had, guess they he's claimed had, he'll never play for them again, which I don't really know how that's going to work. Uh, I didn't see that quote, but, um, you know, that's certainly what his actions suggest. Yeah. Uh, he could just sit out the rest of this four months, probably well, get fined. Oh, well, he's already been fined uh, yeah. 200,000 pounds, yeah, which is... Yeah, a lot to just sit on. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, two weeks, uh, that's two weeks' salary for him, um, uh, which I think is the maximum you can... The maximum you can be fined in in most cases, but right. yeah, it's going uh, nuclear between Mares and Lester. I don't uh, know what Lester was expecting, but it seems like this is so. He's gonna say, he's gonna come back. He's not just gonna burn millions of pounds, you know, for months. But he'll come back, and then he'll it'll be clear. He won't have to say a word that he's very upset. Obviously, they already knew that. But I mean, when will he come back? How does he? Uh, how does he even get back? Well, I he don't. just won't. He won't be 
He's not going to try. <laughs> He's, you're basically going to have a dead player on your squad yeah. for I mean, three months. You can't, you can't start him if he... And I don't yeah, know. They'll have nobody to blame but themselves. It is by far... It, it's, it's worse than the worst case scenario. Basically, it's, it's almost as if they thought Mares was bluffing about... You know, that Wanting he, to go to Manchester that, not, City? They knew he wanted to leave, but I think that they, were, they thought he was bluffing about how, to what degree he... W- will stop his commitment to being the best that he can be. Hmm. And with how hard it is to be a professional soccer in the first place, if you, you got a guy that doesn't care even a little bit, he drops off, and Mahrez is clearly doesn't care at all, and he's basically going to be uh, borderline useless. Right. Yeah, Mahrez is... Uh, you hate to see situations like this, but it happens from time to time. Players fall out with their teams, and yeah, it's the manager's job to bring everybody back on board, which is why Difficult that's job. a job I would never do, <laughs> would never want. Well, maybe by the next time we meet, he will have played or practiced. Uh, but by the next time we meet, we know for sure there will be a new president of U.S. soccer. That election takes place February 10th. That's Saturday. We've, we've discussed this before. There's a large list of candidates. Mm-hmm. I don't know who's winning. There's no, way, really to, separating no way to make it a horse race of any, of any type. There's a bit of controversy, controversy. I've tried my hardest to just ignore it. Yeah. I, I was thinking about this that I don't know if we're even going to be able to see the, sort of the voting results and how close it was I or not. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not the president of the country. It's U.S. soccer. So they can... In, I believe, do whatever the hell they want with what they tell the public. Right. But if they do release how close or not close the election was, if it, if it was any sort of blowout and one person ran away with the election, I will instantly be suspicious of, of that happening. With how much it has seemed that nobody's really separated themselves in this sort of campaign... Well, there... <laughs> you know, well, I'll think that... Do we know nobody's separated? There are no polls... There are no, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no debate. Like there's no, there's no way to evaluate this whole process. Yeah. Unless you're either, you know, unless you're on the ground, talking to the constituents, or right. you know, there's no way. We're all just me, you, pretty much anybody that is paying attention. That is paying attention to it. I haven't I'm not trying to denigrate anybody else's work, but I haven't read much more that much more than speculation. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. A lot of speculation. Because you know, it's an election process and how do you really get a sense of what's going on, especially when there hasn't been a competitive election in over a decade. I, I will say this, that I have listened to a few interviews of the candidates, and they're pretty consistent about saying, oh, I want to do this, this, and this, and providing very little... Uh, <laughs> do they have the power to? What they're going to do, how they're going to do it. Yeah. Not what they're going to do. They're, they say what they're going to do. How they're going to do it is they provide zero detail, and these are long-form interviews where maybe they had the opportunity to provide some detail. Mm-hmm. And also, yeah, I think just none are really even aware of what the job is exactly and what power they're going to have. So uh, I guess my main point with this is when you see whoever is elected president, don't jump and be happy if it's somebody that you wanted. Don't (laughs) be upset if it's somebody that you didn't want because the fact is that you don't know if you like the person or not. That's my end. That's my end of it, I guess. All right. Well, (laughs) I'm glad your passion for the U.S. soccer presidential election has survived all these months. I'll, I mean, I'll certainly be paying attention on Saturday. I just cause, out of curiosity at the end of all this, I have to figure out or see what happens. Yeah. But I guess that wraps it, us, wraps it up for us today. We'll be back next week. Be sure to follow us on... Go and find us on <laughs> iTunes. Get <laughs> into <laughs> iTunes. Search Nesson. Uh, if you've come across this, we also post it on YouTube and SoundCloud. Uh, but the easiest way to consistently access is through iTunes on the podcast app. Search Nesson. You'll see us come up. We appreciate you tuning in every week. And uh, see you again next week.